you don't know me, I'm George Denault. I'm in Scissor. Um, I'm a research professor teaching computer security and things, and I'm really happy to be able to introduce to you uh, Mark Miller. Mark, uh, I've been aware of some of the work that Mark's been doing for a number of years, and finally got a chance to meet him uh, today. We've talked on the phone on several occasions, and it's been uh, really an interesting exercise. Mark, Mark is uh, working uh, primarily in, in what are known as capability-based systems, and he's going to talk to us about uh, immunity from viruses, safety from geeks bearing gifts. We don't know anything about geeks bearing gifts around here. Okay. Um, so, um, what is the problem with viruses? Why are we so vulnerable to them? Uh, sometimes, uh, if you see the explanation from, from somebody explaining why the problem can't be solved, sometimes that can provide insight as to how to solve the problem. So here is Microsoft's first immutable law of security. That's their, that's their term for it, immutable law of security. If a bad guy can persuade you, persuade you to run his program on your computer, it's not your computer anymore. Um, then it proceeds. It's an unfortunate fact of computer science. It's, rather than writing, it's an unfortunate fact of shoddy engineering. Um, but, but, but I don't want to take cheap shots here because this isn't Microsoft specific. It's not, a, it's not a problem of bugs in the classic sense. It's a problem of the paradigm. The bugs are in the paradigm. Uh, and the paradigm is doing computer security the way uh, Windows does it or the way Unix does it, the way any Every one of the mainstream operating systems, any operating system that's ever become popular does it, which is based on a notion called principle. And it's actually well stated here. Once a program is running, it can do anything up to the limits of what you yourself can do on the machine. Uh, so um, you know, Unix might have a good, a, a particular Unix system might have good security with respect to separating the user from authority over the machine as a whole, but every time that user runs a program, uh, that user grants the program all of his own authority. In the normal case, um, let's not argue about set UID. The normal case is that, um, that the user is granting to the program all the privileges that the user has because the program needs that in that architecture in order to carry out its duties. The alternative is uh, classically known as, uh, back in the Salter Schroeder papers from way back when, classic of, of computer security, is known as principled least privilege. The capability community, for various reasons, has been calling it principled least authority, or POLA. Um, it's the same thing, but, but um, POLA to us has become the centerpiece of computer security. And it's the key to solving the virus problem. The, Right now, in all the classic operating systems, um, all, the, all the operating systems that have ever become popular, um, uh, there is two security categories that you can think of programs as being in. There are applications which, to which the Microsoft first immutable law applies that, runs with, that run with the full authority of the user. And they require that full authority in order to be able to be integrated with other things, in order to be able to have it edit your files, in order to have it be able to talk to the network on your behalf, in order for it to be able to do all sorts of things on your behalf, it runs with all of your privileges. Um, and then uh, the other extreme uh, is, is what we've seen with, for example, Java applets, and similarly with JavaScript inside web pages, where it can do any computation. It's a universal Turing machine, so internally it can do any computation, but it has no authority, none of your authorities. You have no ability to grant it authorities. Uh, let's, and once again, let's not argue about you know, the things like the browser certificate systems, which are too awkward for anybody to use. Um, generally, applets run with no authorities. They're therefore isolated. They're therefore useless. They're, they're therefore mostly unused. The sweet spot is um, least authority. Um, uh, and what we've built is a system for running what we call caplets, capability applets or capability applications, um, where the caplets have all of the abilities to be useful that we think of when we think of applications. They're generally as useful as applications are expected to be, but they're running inside a framework that only that, such that the user only needs to provide them with the authorities they need to bring about their duties. And one of the things that's been really a surprise to us, because one of the things you don't know it until you try it, 
is that within our framework, it is not a great burden for the user It is not a great burden for the user to engage in, so to speak, the extra specification of granting a caplet the needed authority. The, the naive thing that one might think is that, oh, well, least authority is very good, but the reason I would just want to run applications and, and, and subject myself to all the danger um, is that who wants to go about all the extra trouble of, of, telling, of telling the system what particular authorities to authorize uh, um, to authorize the caplet it's having. Why, who wants to engage in all that extra acts of authorization? The thing about our framework, as, as we'll see, we're going to be launching into a code demo shortly, um, a demonstration of our system. Um, but the thing about our system and bringing the concepts of capabilities out through the user interface into a user interface metaphor uh, is that there is no extra work. In fact, there's less work than, um, than in the classic um, the classic and much less secure way of interacting with the computer. So uh, before uh, shifting to the demo, I just want to give a preview of this will be the final, the final shot on the, on the demo. And it shows um, the, same, the same code that's trying to attack you running side by side in two different environments. On the left side, uh, we see the evil malicious renderer running within the cap desk framework with, in, in which it's constrained to, to uh, only have the authority necessary to carry out its duties. That's the least authority. Is what's the authority needed for it to carry out its duties but no more. So as it tries these various exploits to tar try to harm us, it finds all those explo exploits, are, it's unable to proceed with them. And over here, uh, we're We've created um, a unconfined, I should say, over here, the, the, term, the terminology we use, going back to Butler Lampson's confined papers, we, we're running into the confined context. We're in a context where its only ability to, con to connect with the outside world is according to authorities explicitly granted to it. Over here, it's running unconfined. It's running, in fact, um, the way Every program you normally run on a computer runs. That's what, what, why the title over here, which is normal. What everybody accepts as normal here is what we're seeing on the right-hand side over here, where it's able to, to, um, to compromise your security in a number of ways. And we'll, we'll see that in a moment. OK. So this is CapDesk, our capability secure desktop. Um, uh, right, the, right now, it's, it happens to be running on top of Windows, but it's, it's, it's written in an OS independent way. Um, so, by the way, everything you're seeing is written in the e-programming language, which is our capability secure programming language. Uh, I'll get into the language, uh, language issues when, we, when we're pa past the demo and get back to the slides. Um, but um, but in any case, uh, desktops, uh, for a good reason, start with, with something like a file explorer. So over here, you're just seeing a classic file explorer. And over here, um, we've navigated and we see this file over here called test.txt. Now, I'm going to do something. The thing that's, that's, that's important about this demo is everything looks very normal. I mean, I'm, it's a very strange thing to do in a demo is to show off how unsurprising the look of things are because they're all a bunch of user interface actions and gestures that people are familiar with, but we've given them new security meaning in an intuitive way. And well, I'll, I'll do it first and then I'll explain it. Okay, so over here we select test.txt. I'll start off just talking through in terms of what it normally means, what these, what these actions normally mean. So I right click on open with, then I select cap edit, I click. I think I clicked. Yeah, there it goes. And I get a notepad-like text, text editor called CapEdit. CapEdit, of course, for a capability editor. Now, the, if this was a 
classic interaction under any, any widespread operating system. Um, this text editor would now be running with all of my privileges. So while it's uh, scanning the disk, finding my PGP key, and auctioning off to the highest bidder on eBay, um, uh, it's also letting me edit one of my files. So I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that it's letting me edit one of my files while it's destroying my life in secret. Uh, uh, but that's, that's the classic situation. Uh, a caplet, however, in this case, um, uh, this thing is a caplet. CapEdit is a caplet. Um, and a caplet, by default, has very, very limited authorities. In particular, if we just launched it directly, it would have the authority to render below the title bar and above this bar on the bottom, which is called the power bar, the, the bar with the, the cut, copy, paste icons. The, the title bar and the power bar themselves are outside of its control. Um, it has the ability to receive user interface events that are directed at it, specifically mouse motion over its part of this window and keyboard events when it has the focus. It has no ability to do keyboard sniffing if I'm talking to some other application. Um, and crucially, it has, by default, no access to the network, no access to the file system. Okay? But if it has no access to the file system, how does it have the contents of my test.txt file? Okay? The reason is because I gave, it to, I gave it that access. I gave it that authority. I gave it that authority by the user interface action with which I launched the program. That by selecting test.txt and opening it, um, that was an act of designation. Uh, I was saying which thing it should operate on. Uh, and one of the fundamental insights about capabilities is that capabilities bundle designation with authority. So, and um, modern user interface metaphors are these masterworks of designation. There's billions of dollars of investment, both in the creating of them and in all of our training times. There's billions of dollars of investment in learning how to operate these vast machines of designation, which really come down to, to a large language of different ways to say, this thing should operate on that thing. Well, what we've done by just following the capability philosophy is we've if we, is pursued the very simple insight that if this thing should operate on that thing, then it's become part of the duties of, that, of this thing to operate on that thing. So by the principle of least authority, the least authority to be provided to this thing is the authority to be able to operate on the designated object. So we've turned acts of designation into also being acts of authorization. And that's, that's the key economy of operating the user interface that we're seeing here. So some other examples. Just, you know, just pursuing the same philosophy. If I take some file and I do a drag and drop, a drag and drop is like perfect capability metaphor. There's no names involved, just direct designation. This thing there. If I just do a drag and drop of this onto the, the caplet, uh, the caplet is now able to pop up another, you know, pop up another one, now has access to this other file because I gave it access to the other file. It has no ability, to, it doesn't even know where in the file systems these files are. It doesn't know that there is a file system. Uh, it has no access to the network. Over, in this case, I gave it access to a secret file who shot JFK uh, that, that even if this caplet had been written by somebody evil, it has no ability to communicate that out to anybody else. It, it knows it, but it can't tell anybody. Uh, just one more example of the same principle before we get to the next part of the demo. By the, way, by the way, when I say demo here, I should say all the software, uh, the security properties here are real. We've, we've gone through a security review, um, uh, very intense experience of security review found bugs. Uh, so the software is not sec actually secure yet, but the security review um, was for the purpose of assessing is the architecture sound, is this an architecture that is securable? And the answer was yes. Um, um, uh, however, Outside of engineering the security, a lot of the rest of what you're seeing is at the proof, proof of concept level rather than the product level. So I just want to get, get the expectation level straight here so people don't say, but that icon doesn't look pretty enough or whatever. Um, okay, so over here I've clicked on an icon uh, which looks like an, an open file dialog box icon and it's in the part of the caplet's window that the caplet can render so it might be anything, it might be or mean anything at all. But it doesn't matter because it can, the caplet can only, do, as, a, as a result of my pressing on it, 
do those things which are within the authorities that it has to exercise. Um, so one of the authorities that I didn't, the only authority in fact that I didn't mention is it has the ability, it has the authority to ask the human user for more authorities. Um, so in this case, it said to the, um, it said to the trusted code, it said, um, uh, I believe, it said the equivalent of, I believe the human being wants to give me the authority to edit yet another file. Please give the human user a chance to do so. So the trusted code and, uh, rendered this thing that looks like a, a, an open file dialog box. And in fact, its meaning in the context of the system is precisely the meaning of an open file dialog box. But let me point out some differences. Um, first of all, justification colon to edit for you. In general, this being a, a window rendered by trusted code, um, the uh, user can, should be able to look at this window and basically uh, know that it's rendered by trusted code and believe what he's looking at. Uh, however, um, the caplet provided the string to edit for you as the string to be displayed to the user and as the caplet's explanation for why the user should be providing it the file. Okay? Um, the justification colon is our lightweight way to remind the user that this string is coming from somebody else. It's not, it's, not some, it's not simply a claim made by the trusted code. It's a presentation by the trusted code of, of a claim made by, by the requester. Okay, the other more important difference is the capability philosophy on names. Um, so over here when I select a name, um, if I hit grant, I'm granting, the author I'm granting edit authority on this object. Now, in a classic open file dialog box, what the API is doing is it's providing the name to the application. Any system that communicates what to open by communicating a name necessarily violates POLA and necessarily then in leads towards the sins that Microsoft thinks are inevitable because if it can act on the name in order to open the file, then it could come up with another name and open a different file. You ha the, it has to be the trusted code that treats the namespace purely as a, w as a way to interact with the user and then creates an opaque authorization to operate on something that's what's, tr that's, that's what's transferred to the caplet. Okay, now, uh, cap edit is the typical case for a caplet. Uh, once again, something we didn't know before we started in on this exercise, but one of, the, one of the pleasant surprises is that the typical caplet does not require any extra authority other than the authority provided by interacting with it. Um, uh, some uh, other caplets are not in quite so happy a situation. Uh, so in particular, the DARPA browser, this is a browser we did under contract to DARPA, uh, and that was the one that was specifically subject to the, the security review, um, a security review and attack, a very, very intense experience. Oops, did not want to drag it, okay. Okay, oops, hold on. Um, I'm going to close this and then reopen it because I'm getting a, a surprise. I don't, somehow the, my, my user interface, yeah. Okay, I'm getting some strange interaction on the drag and drop here. Um, so I'm gonna close this and reopen it. You have to bear with me for a while. Okay. Um, so the DARPA browser, uh, was an exercise in uh, could you build a browser that um, uh, took a renderer as an untrusted component and used a renderer in order to render the, the, uh, the web page. Um, and uh, so the exercise between browser and renderer is very much like the exercise between cap desk and caplet. Um, uh, but in this case, ev even harder in some ways because uh, a browser and its render have to interact more intimately than a desktop has to, has to interact with the applications it's running. Now, the thing about a browser with respect to my previous point is that a browser 
you don't want to have to authorize it every time to access the network. Um, uh, you just want it to be able to authorize it once, say, yes, I want this browser to be able to access the network, and then be done with it. So, okay, My, our weird drag and drop stuck itness has gone away here. Um, so if we click on install, we now go to the part of this user interface which is the most different and necessarily the most different than the um, user interfaces people are used to, which is the install dialog. Okay. Um, all caplets have this first tab, um, the, the pet data tab, and then depending on what other authorities the caplet states that it wants to be, what other authorities it wants to be granted at install time, uh, for, it gets further tabs over here. What the pet data tab is about is that um, if I'm installing your caplet and your caplet comes up and says, I would, like to be I, I would like to be called Quicken and I would like to be identified with the Quicken icon, um, then you'd really like for it not to be called Quicken and you, when, the, when, it's title, when the title bar on, on Windows for, rendered for that caplet come up, you don't want it to say Quicken because then you might be misled into interacting with it like it's Quicken. Um, however, there's, uh, you don't want to try to resort to a global namespace because then you get into the whole CA hierarchy mess uh, and it's completely unnecessary. Um, really, the, the naming issue is, is an issue of what's meaningful for me. It's a purely private namespace. So the reason we call them pet names is whereas you might have a nickname, uh, if you have a nickname, then everybody who knows you might know the same nickname for you. Whereas I might have a pet name for you. And somebody else might have a different pet name for you. So pet names are a property of a relationship. Um, so over here, uh, the caplet gets to suggest um, uh, what pet name to, to be called. And generally, if it's not confusing, you just accept it. But this allows the user to give it a pet name that's, that's meaningful to the user uh, so the user can remember what it is he's installed. And then that gets identified then in the title bar. Same thing with the pet icon. Okay. Now, in this case, the important thing about a web browser is it wants to talk various protocols. So in this case, in this particular browser, wants to speak file colon and HTTP colon. Now, um, if it can speak, if you, let, if you let it have file colon, well, then it can read, let's say, your whole hard disk or all the hard disks that you can read. Um, uh, uh, so it can read your PGP private keys and it can get at all of your secrets, your who shot JFK document. But that's okay. It can read it all. It can't write anything and it can't talk to the network. So it knows all your secrets, but it can't tell anyone. Okay. Um, if you give it HTTP, then it can talk to the network so it can tell anybody your secrets, but doesn't know any of them. If you give it both, then, um, you know, then you've allowed it to both gain your secrets and communicate them out. So based on what combinations of things it's asking for, um, the trusted code then um, renders this warning text that tells the user um, uh, what, what dangers to be aware of. So in this case, we're what we're going to do is, is we're going to install this one just with HTTP colon. So this is the one that can communicate out but not read our files. And to remember that that's what we've done with this, with this installation of the browser, we can call this one external browser. We, could, we might, um, what, the, the, what I'm about to say, I should be careful. Um, uh, right now in this version of the software, you can't actually install the same program multiple ways with unique names. We only have one installation per version of the software. That's coming in the next version. But ignoring that issue for a moment, you could have an internal browser, an external browser, which you use for the two respective tasks. And now they're isolated from each other. They're both instances of the same program. They're both a result of, ins be of installing the same program and the same user doing the installation, but they're isolated from each other. The one that knows the secrets can't tell. The ones that can tell can't know. So in okay, so we install one of them as external browser. Installation succeeded. Now let's go ahead and run it. Okay, and we've also launched a web server on this machine since we're not connected to the actual network. The web server is uh, also 
uh, written in E. It's Capsicom, the uh, capability-based spicy web server. Um, and well, you've already seen the gospel according to Microsoft, so I won't bore you with showing you that through our web server again. Um, e language in a walnut is our nutshell-like book, uh, introductory book on, um, on learning E. Just to show you how non-productized this stuff is, we don't even have a back button. We have to truncate the URL to go back. Okay. Um, the, as we saw before with the application and applet, the one notion of caplet can do both duties. So a caplet is something you can download from the web from some, uh, here's, here, by the way, over here is some actual E source code. This is the source code for this applet. And over here is, I'm sorry, for this caplet. And over here is the evil editor. And um, I'm just going to do the JFK thing again because I want to make a new point. So over here, um, engaging only in user interface actions whose security implications are intuitive and understandable without having to learn, uh, without having to do passwords or learn about certificate lists or some whole separate interaction about security, except a little bit at installation, um, uh, we're able to uh, know that we can grant this secret file, the information in the secret file, to a caplet that we just downloaded from who knows where over the net where the caplet window in turn was launched by a program, the DARPA browser, to which we had given access to the net. Okay? Even though the caplet was launched from the browser and the browser had access to the net because of what we know is communicated by these title bars and because the browser does not have um, uh, does, does, not have, does not have an ability to relabel a title bar, uh, we know that we're talking to a brand new uh, inst instantiation of a caplet, and we know that we haven't granted it authority to talk, uh, talk to the net so that we can give it the secret. Okay. Now, finally, there is the evil renderer exercise. So let's truncate back to over here. Select renderer. Okay. So um, the browser itself is a caplet. It, it has no ability to directly uh, access the file system to get at the renderers, but through the same interaction we've seen, we can be provide we can provide it with the evil renderer. So, okay, so this is the evil malicious renderer running in the confined environment. Okay, and here is the very same evil renderer code running in a browser that I launched directly from the Windows desktop um, in order, to, and I needed to be able, I needed to launch it from the Windows desktop in order for it to have all of my privileges um, rather than only the privileges that I granted it. And now let's take a look at um, at the differences in how these things run. So uh, over here, it's, um, well, the first thing the evil render does is it tries to see what privileges it has. And it realizes in this case that it, that it seems to have st standard Winix privileges. By Winix, we mean Windows or Unix. It makes no difference. The bug is in the paradigm. Okay? Uh, trying to read directory system. It detects it has a Windows NT directory system. The same code on Unix will, will let you know that you have a Unix directory system. Uh, ready to read all confidential documents and, and email. Uh, at, this at this point in the pr and running, it doesn't actually do the reading, but it does actually check that it's able to. Um, over here, um, it, the same code fails. It's actually you know, in a try-catch block, and the exception happens, and it never actually succeeds at, doing, at, at 
uh, gaining the confidential data. Uh, over here, it detects the file system's editable, lo uh, ready to load Trojan horse horses, identity theft, blah. Um, over here, it fails to, to edit the file system. Over here, it succeeds at opening a socket, um, and it now gets ready to send out email viruses uh, on my behalf. Um, uh, it doesn't, and since it can open a socket, it doesn't actually detect that it's not connected to the internet. Um, over here, it fails, to be, it fails to, to be able to open a socket. And assault complete, assault complete. Now, what you've just seen is the easiest rig demo in the world to create. It's just two text files. What's the big deal? Um, the big deal is that we put our security reviewers, David Wagner and D of uh, Professor at Berkeley and Dean Treble of Agorix, we put them uh, in the position of having to write a malicious, re of, you know, could they write a malicious renderer which could do more damage than this? As I, and as I mentioned, uh, their answer was yes due to bugs, but their answer was there were no architectural bugs. The architecture is sound and that with moderate amount of, of work, this can be a securable, you know, this is, this is definitely a securable architecture. With a moderate amount of work, it can be made secure. Um, but, um, okay, now, back to the talk. I keep saying capabilities. Capabilities this, capabilities that, capability principles. And uh, since a lot of you guys are studying computer security, I imagine a lot of you are very puzzled because there's the capabilities the way it's taught. Um, and capabilities the way they're taught um, are rooted in uh, the access matrix myth. Uh, the access matrix was in its time a brave attempt by Butler Lampson at creating a formalism to try to capture uh, in, a, you know, in an abstraction people can reason about certain properties of capabilities. And the capability systems that even at the time and, and well preceding Lamson's work were already more powerful than the formalism could, could describe. But unfortunately the formalism took over in academic reasoning about capabilities and, and powers of capabilities beyond this formalism, uh, people stopped seeing. Uh, people started criticizing capabilities in terms, by, in terms of taking the formalism as the reality. Uh, what this formalism is, is that you have a set of principles over here. You have a set of resources over here. The principles might be different accounts or different people. Um, the resources might be canonically different files on the file system or different authorities over files in the file system. Um, like in this case, read authority versus edit authority. Um, and then the access list versus capabilities is, is just a different data structure for representing equivalent information. That access lists represent the information with the resources to which, what principle is able to access the resource. Uh, capabilities, and this is called an access list, of course. And then over in capabilities, the corresponding thing is called a C list or a capability list, uh, which is just a list of which resources the capability can get at. Uh, this is uh, the reality of capability systems. Uh, the reality of capability systems um, is that there are no separate principles and resources. There are rather objects operating on objects operating on objects. It's a compositional system. If there's, if there's two categories, then you get to reason at one level, but you don't get to reason compositionally. Uh, by the way, I should say, for many of the individual steps that I'm taking, there have been people who've started with the access matrix and taken those steps, evolved this, the access matrix to try to deal with some of these issues. But the problem is they're starting from the wrong model and they're trying to fix the wrong model rather than starting from this model. And this model, by the way, for, for, for language guys in the room, this model corresponds to what you would expect from the lambda calculus. Uh, but also, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stay away from the lambda calculus, but I will talk about programming language issues. Um, Object-oriented programming is also corresponds to this model. Uh, and that's the place where people are most familiar with um, the logic of this diagram, although they don't have this visualization, which is Alice, Bob, and Carol are simply three objects. Alice in the initial condition um, cover the, the, the foo and the arrow coming out of the foo for a moment. Alice in the, in, her, in the initial condition has a pointer to Bob and has a pointer to Carol. And then the, what's happening dynamically here is that Alice is sending a message to Bob 
where that message carries um, uh, as an argument a copy of Alice's pointer to Carol. And over here is uh, an example of, uh, it could just as easily be a snippet of Java or a snippet of C++. It's syntactically a little bit different than, than it would look in, in E, but, but not, not unrecognizably so. Um, uh, but it's simply uh, Alice is some object in, sent, invoking the message foo, invoking the member function in C++ terminology with argument Carol. That's all that's going on here. Now, once again, what we're doing in creating a capability secure language is we're playing the same trick that we played at the user interface level. And, uh, the, um, and that is to bundle designation with authority. Modern programming languages with lexical scoping and closures and imports and exports and, and instance variable declarations and all these things are once again these wondrous machines of designation. And the logic of the designation that they provide already follows the logic of capabilities. All that's required is to have those, those designators, the pointers, the object references, be the, the means of authority, be the capabilities. Um, so now I'm going to do in one slide a full definition of capability security. Um, they, while standing on one foot, no, no. Um, so um, beginning with objects and, and the way this picture corresponds with objects, uh, the definition of capability security starts by enumerating all the ways Bob can get access to Carol. Um, and there are these four ways. These four ways are provided for in object-oriented programming. The thing that makes the system a capability system is that there are no further ways beyond these four. Um, uh, uh, so the, these four are, if Bob and Carol already exist and Bob doesn't already have access to Carol, that Bob can only gain access to Carol if there's a, by, well, okay, the first one is by introduction. If there's a third party such as Alice that already has a reference to Carol, already has a reference to Bob, and voluntarily decides to share with Bob her reference to Carol. Now, um, let me point out as I go some differences with the access matrix view. In the access matrix view, um, Bob and Carol might both be on Alice's capability list, but the access matrix, the account given by people who do formalism based on the access matrix, usually only go so far as to say that Alice must have a pointer to Carol in order for Alice to grant Bob a pointer to Carol. They do not usually enumerate that Alice must have a pointer to Bob. And without that, without that, without that letter, second condition, the, the, the ref to Bob condition here, you cannot do confinement. And in fact, there have been many capability systems, or many almost capability systems that could not do confinement because they left out that step. And they left that step out because of the blind spot created by the legacy of bad formalism. OK. Um, now. Um, uh, the next way Bob can obtain reference to Carol is by parenthood. Uh, if Bob already exists and Carol does not, any such system must have an object creation primitive. At the moment of, if Bob invokes that primitive to create Carol, at the moment of creation, Bob obtains the only reference to Carol. Uh, and then uh, all further uh, uh, references to Carol that any, anybody else must get must then be by introduction from there. Okay. Um, uh, next one is by construction. Uh, if Carol already exists and Bob does not, then Alice, who already has a pointer to Carol, might construct Bob such that Bob is, bo is born holding a pointer to Carol as part of his initial endowment. And then finally, by initial conditions, that's where if nothing at all exists, it all comes into being simultaneously at T0, because that's the start of our analysis. At T0, there's some initial connectivity, some initial configuration, everything proceeds forward from there. Okay. Those, are, those are all of the ways that connectivity happens. Then, um, uh, the next condition is absolute encapsulation. Uh, that in the Java world, this is known as type safety, but, uh, but, but it doesn't rely on static types. Smalltalk provides absolute encapsulation with dynamic types. Uh, what absolute encapsulation is really about is 
that from outside an object, if you have access to the object by having a reference to the object, capability to the object, you cannot, that does not enable you to violate its abstraction boundary. That an object has an abstraction boundary such that it receives requests, messages, um, from the outside and then to respond to that request it has some internal machinery including capabilities that it holds which, but, but it is purely its internal construction, its internal constitution how it re, that determines how it reacts to the outside messages employing the capabilities it has in order to bring about some effect. So in general when you're reasoning about security and capabilities you treat the object as a black box but you treat the reference graph as the constraints on what it can do. The object cannot, do, oh, and I'm sorry, that that's actually leads into the final point. All the points so far, many object languages satisfy all the points so far. The place where, where, where object language, and, and they, most, they generally satisfy them accidentally because they're not trying to be capability secure. Um, the, play, the, the one thing that you don't seem to be able to get to accidentally, you have to be doing it on purpose, is this final point that the only authority an object should have to affect or be affected by the world outside itself should be according to the capabilities it holds or the capabilities others hold to it, period. Uh, so for example, any system with a global variable, if there's any global variables or in Java static variables or in Smalltalk class variables, you've blown it, no capability security. Um, the all um, similarly, if there are static methods in Java, for example, that can be invoked in order to cause some effect in the outside world, like the file system, you've blown it. Um, uh, an object, a good test is an object with no capabilities should not be able to do anything that, other than internal computation. The only thing it should be able to do is, is you know, suck down CPU time and, and occupy memory space. And if it can do anything beyond that, then you've really got to wonder, is this a capability system? Um, okay. Um, actually, I'm going to I, I did a slide just this morning that's not on, on the handout, um, which I'm going to jump to just to hammer, hammer home this point about uh, the, the equivalence myth. Um, uh, the left column is uh, uh, ACLs, access control lists, according to the matrix formalism. The, the, the next column is capabilities according to the matrix formalism. Next column is a very interesting certificate system called uh, Spooky, Simple Public Key Infrastructure, uh, which uh, done by a variety of people, including uh, Rivest and Lamson uh, and some real capability people. Um, but uh, uh, it, interestingly, even though it's a capability system, uh, it actually shares most of the, the sins of capabilities according to the matrix model. And then capabilities generally in practice um, are the last column. Um, the rows here are uh, resource versus principle. By, resor by resource, I mean is there a separation, um, oh, I'm sorry, by resource versus, uh, resource versus principle is, as it, is it stored with the resource versus the principle? So that's the distinction, that's the only distinction that the access matrix makes. Then do you have a static or dynamic model? The main sin of the access matrix itself, which other people have repaired in, within the access matrix paradigm, but the sin of the access matrix itself is that it's just a static model. They're just saying how, how is a snapshot represented? And if, just, if you're just representing a snapshot, who cares? You don't have a security model yet. It's only when you start doing dynamic, you, when you have to, to reason about permissions to change permissions, do you even have a security model to reason about? Um, uh, then there's resource versus object. This is the first distinction that I was making, um, which is uh, uh, do you have a segregated world of principles operating on resources, which, are, which then leads to a two-level notion of security, or do you have a composable world of objects operating on objects operating on objects in a network? Um, so that's why I label uh, this position composable. Then there's names versus authority. Um, not only is there a tremendous economy of engineering effort in bundling designation with authority, as you've seen, but there's also um, there's a very important form of attack called the confused deputy, uh, which I'll, I'll uh, leave you to, to web searching to, to find out about. But basically, if names and authorities are separated, um, 
then uh, uh, deputies can be confused. Uh, let's see, I, I should say something short about that. Um, the, uh, if names and authorities are separated, then um, uh, I can lead you by speaking a name to use an authority that you have on my behalf when I was, when, because you're looking up the authority by name I provided you. Whereas if I had, if I just provide you the authorities, then if, you're, then if your attempt is to only use the authorities that I'm, that come in as arguments for me, the authorities I'm describing, then I can't mislead you into using an authority that I don't have. That's what, that's what the confusable, confused deputy is. And then there's the required Alice Bob link, which I mentioned, um, which is the key to confinement. If you don't have that, you don't have confinement. You can't do any of the confinement of caplets that, that I was demonstrating. Okay. So, um, uh, capabilities, I uh, made this identity at, at a fundamental level between it and object-oriented programming. It turns out the capabilities as a, as a style of programming is actually just the extreme of what's good about good object-oriented programming. Security as a programming style is just the extreme of modularity. Another way to put that is modularity is about avoiding needless dependencies between modules. Um, Trust is a form of dependency. So avoiding needless trust, avoiding needless vulnerability is good modularity practice. Um, uh, information hiding as, as, as good software engineers advocated, corresponds to the security principle of need to know. Principle of least authority is the additional extension of that principle of providing authorities only on a need to do basis. Okay. E itself is a, um, Dynamic distributed language, um, and what, uh, distributed capability secure language. So what, so what distributed capabilities are about is that uh, each of the gray boxes here is a different machine. Each of the uh, blue or green, blue green boxes inside of them is a VAT, which is our equivalent of a process. It's, just, it's an aggregation of objects. For, for capability properties within a VAT, among objects within a VAT, we just use safe language techniques. By safe language techniques, if you're thinking Java, you're not too far off. Um, uh, with, when, capability, when capability transactions, i.e. message passing, is happening between objects on the network, then we use cryptography. We have a, cap a, a cryptographic protocol called Pluribus um, that provides for object messages on the network all the same capability security properties. Um, and the result is that for many purposes, not for all purposes, but for many purposes, in reasoning about the security of a system, you can reason about the little orange circles and the messages and the references, and you can forget the machine boundaries and you can forget the VAT boundaries. For many security purposes, for a surprising number of security purposes, and once again, it's one of those surprises where you only, you, you only get, to find, get, this, get to have this pleasant surprise if you do it, um, is that the, if you just reason about the internet as a heap of objects at finest grain and ignore the machine boundaries, you can do much of your security reasoning at that level. Uh, this uh, is the, a slide I don't have time to go into, but this is um, the essential cryptographic logic of how we bring about uh, distributed capability security. I'll just be very brief here. Uh, the VAT ID is the fingerprint of the public key of the VAT hosting the object designated. So every VAT on creation generates a public private key pair, uh, and then it, it, uh, it remembers the private key. Uh, that's what it means to be that VAT, is to, is that, is to know the private key and be, be willing to use it. Um, and then the VAT ID, the fingerprint of its public key, becomes the, uh, the designator that other people have for the VAT. No CA hierarchies in the picture. Okay? This is a completely decentralized system. There's nothing to the picture, no, no parties in the picture other than what you're seeing here. Um, uh, the Swiss number is uh, uh, a unguessable random number assigned by Carol's VAT when a, the first internal reference to Carol first gets exported over the comm system. Carol's VAT assigns an unguessable random number. So when Alice um, Ha, since Alice has a distributed reference to Carol, Alice knows this pair of numbers. When Alice wants to tell Bob that pair uh, to you know, communicate a capability to Carol, he has to communicate a pair of numbers. 
Um, I'm actually I'm, I'm close enough to fin being finished explaining the slide that I'll just complete it. Um, a capability is an arrow. An arrow has two ends. There is an apostle problem in, in each direction. The authenticity property that is the entire authenticity property that a capability infrastructure has to satisfy and that, and that this does is that when Bob wants to invoke Carol, Carol's VAT needs to only allow an invocation if it's coming from someone that Alice authorized to invoke Carol. Somebody, you know, I, Alice or anybody in Alice's type of position. Somebody who had, who was already authorized, has to authorize Bob. Um, and furthermore, the Bob has to know that the entity that he's invoking is, an enti is the entity that Alice meant to designate. Okay? That's it. There's no correspondence with some previous human namespace for some hu human level administrators to try to, to, try to, car to try to figure out in order to get the authenticity of the infrastructure right. Okay, and this is actually my concluding slide. Um, uh, so this is the, um, this is the history of influences that ended up with E. Hydra really means, uh, is really a stand in here for o the old classical capability operating systems including CAP and Plessy, et cetera. But I think Hydra is really the jewel of that school. Um, and Kikos was really the place where a lot of the capability ideas came together well. Okay, um, I'd like to take questions for my remaining brief time. Let me do a revocation. Okay. Um, I'm so glad you asked. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have a slide for that yet, but I'll just use this. Um, the, uh, let's say that uh, Alice wants to give Bob not access to Carol directly, but wants to give Bob revocable access to Carol. So uh, uh, Alice might create another object called um, Charlie that is a transparent forwarder that forwards all invocations that, that, it, that it gets to Carol. So, so Alice creates Charlie with Carol as Charlie's initial endowment. Um, Charlie then acts for all purposes like Carol because uh, the only interaction with an object is by sending messages to it. Uh, except that uh, Alice holds a, ha holds a revoking access to Charlie. Alice, Charlie and, and Alice, let's say, also share another piece of state which is an object that represents, am I still okay? And then Alice uh, says to that thing, stop being okay, in which case Charlie is revoked. Uh, when Charlie is revoked, Bob now has something that's no longer equivalent to Carol. Bob now has an inactive object, something that will, will stop forwarding. Um, uh, the, one of the things that's very interestingly different between capabilities and other paradigms with respect to revocation uh, is that um, uh, if Bob shares his access to Charlie with others, all they have access to in turn is Charlie. So when Alice revokes Bob's access to Carol by revoking Charlie, then everyone that Bob shared Charlie with, their access is revoked as well. Oh, come on, I was trying to be provocative. Give me some questions. When you mentioned you were going through evaluation, can you tell us if you were going through which specific types? It was, it, was not a, it was not a formal, um, you know, it was, it was not one of the formal, part of the formal uh, evaluation processes. It was um, uh, just a, a, uh, a week of uh, getting beaten up very intensely by uh, David Wagner and Dean Treble uh, on the Berkeley campus. where they, they were spending a week full time at it. We were spending a week full time helping them out. And then they wrote up their report. Uh, it's available on the convex.com website. Um, if you go to eWrites.org, either place where you'll get there. Uh, it's a 22 page detailed report. Uh, and uh, for every, if you look, go to the, you should read the HTML version. In the HTML version, um, we have it up in several formats, but in the HTML version, for every problem that they found, for every weakness that they found in our system, uh, we have a bug, we put in a bug icon, which is a link into our bug tracking database. So you can track our, our progress in fixing all the weaknesses they identified. I don't know that we have any more Well, give, give it a try. No, we don't. No, we don't. Oh. Okay.
Thank you. If you have more questions, Mark will be up here. Thank you very much.